It is 12.03 and we'll get rolling here. Um, hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Andrew Robinson. I am AdCraft's 114th president. And on behalf of the entire AdCraft board of directors, thank you for joining us today for our first webinar of 2021. Uh, we're planning a lot of exciting programs uh, this year. So be sure to follow us uh, on your social media channels. Um, as a nonprofit, we rely on your support and the support of all of our members. So if you are not already an AdCraft member, it only takes a few short minutes. You could even do it right now. We wouldn't be mad. Um, go to adcraft.org and sign up. Thank you so much for considering. Um, now, I'd just like to take a minute or two to highlight a few of our upcoming events before we, uh, we begin the main event today. Um, upcoming events, uh, the D Show. We're excited to announce that the D Show, our annual celebration of Detroit creativity is back for its 14th year. And it'll take place this June, little different timing this year. Um, but the call for entries uh, period is now open and we've added some new categories, including PR, branded entertainment and creative use of media. So to learn more about this and all of our other categories um, and how to enter, go to thedshow.org. Uh, Bingo Wednesdays, we've kicked off our Bingo Wednesdays last night. And this is not your typical uh, grandma's bingo. If you haven't already signed up, now's your chance to network virtually with your fellow ad crafters and win some great prizes. It's a great way to, uh, to shake up the monotony of the week uh, and plan something for your you know, middle, middle of the week Wednesdays. Um, the event is free for all AdCraft members and it's $5 for non-members. Uh, so registration is now open for our next Wednesday. Uh, go to adcraft.org. And the last one here is AdCraftFest. Crazy that we're already talking about AdCraftFest, but the save the date for AdCraftFest 2021 is here. Uh, this year's event will take place on Monday, May 10th at Detroit Golf Club. Uh, registration will open in March and you know the drill. It will sell out very quickly. So save that date um, and follow us on social media for more details. Um, that event's going to be awesome and I can't wait to see you all in person. Now to what we've been here for, what we've been waiting for, it's definitely not to hear me talk. Uh, we're excited to kick off this round of our agency spotlight. It's our new webinar series highlighting the people and the work that make Detroit advertising what it is, uh, which is great. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to in introduce today's speakers. Sean Clausen, Chief Strategy Officer at Bond Brand Loyalty, and Jason Spraka, Global Director of Customer Experience at Ford Motor Company. Jason has served many roles during his 16 year tenure with Ford Motor Company and was most recently appointed the Global Director of Customer Experience in 2020 after leading the US Customer Experience team for two years. In his current role, he's responsible for creating world-class customer experiences through the sales and ownership throughout the sales and ownership cycle. Jason brings together multiple organizations within Ford to drive cohesion and seamless integration for customer interactions. So welcome, Jason, great, great to have you. And Sean joined Bond Brand Loyalty in 2009 as executive creative director. He has taken years of millennial marketing, experiential excitement and an appetite for innovation into, into new realms. He now draws on loyalty and customer experience vocabularies to innovate better in-store, digital, and people-related solutions that create return on investment and repeat customers. So please help me give a warm AdCraft welcome to Sean and Jason. And guys, it's all you. Take it away. Thanks, Andrew. Sean? How are you? Good. How are you? Thanks, Thank Andrew. You. We're uh, really excited to be here with AdCraft, um, and it, it's an exciting opportunity for Ford and Bond to share some of the things that we're working on and what we've been thinking about this last year. Yeah, I'm excited for this chat. I know, Jay, you, you and your team are working tirelessly to kind of uh, imagine uh, that new experience for the future for Ford customers. Um, I, I brought and packed some stuff from other industries and other markets and things like that. So we'll, we'll maybe walk through that as a, a bit of a backdrop to this chat and 
and maybe thanks to everybody from uh, from AdCraft for having us and for all of you uh, tuning in. Um, yeah, absolutely. And and we're going to take questions in the chat and even uh, take a little pause midway to see if we can answer any um, questions that are on people's minds. So we're excited to be here with AdCraft and we'll get rolling. Okay, so uh, our topic today is uh, about reinventing uh, the way we look at customers, them reinventing themselves, some of the transformational experiences they're having, they're having with brands, and, uh, and maybe grounding that in the market examples uh, that I packed for us. Um, this is part of uh, work that we do at Bond uh, in sort of keeping our, our finger on the pulse of what's going on in the marketplace. We're all uh, in various degrees, uh, a little dis more disconnected than we used to be, uh, despite being on Zoom all day long. Uh, and so we've been gathering up uh, as part of that uh, market intel, you know, just what's going on market to market, how fast things are moving. Uh, and so I packed a few of those things in and, uh, and we can chat about those. Yeah. What, no. what it might, sorry, man. No, go what ahead, Sean. <laughs> what I might do is maybe just color uh, a little backdrop, Jason, uh, for the chat that we're going to have, uh, a bit of a perspective on, uh, on how, I'm, I want to say how 21 is shaping up, but um, I feel like, you know, maybe like no other year, it's really informed by all of what went on last year. And so uh, as the year flipped over, uh, the new year consumers typically, you know, we, we as people renew our habits, we we make new commitments, uh, you know, that last for varying periods of time. And um, this year, it felt like we were more saying good riddance to 2020 than we were like welcoming uh, 21. And I, I couldn't help but like, somebody was like, how do you feel about last year? And I don't know about you, man, but I was like, I don't even know yet how I feel about last year. It yeah. was a lot. 2020 was insane. And it was, um, it was hard for everybody across business and in the world. Um, and I think we're all glad to leave it behind and looking forward to 21. But I, I think 2020 offered us an opportunity for businesses to really step forward in new and unique ways and, and customer centricity and really delivering on things um, that our customers want and need and be adaptable allowed a lot of companies to really step to the forefront in a time that frankly, no one expected to happen. So it, it was it was yeah. challenging in a thousand different regards, but a year in which um, the best companies that were ready were um, able to step forward and set themselves up for a bright future. Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of speculation, you know, coming, coming towards the end of last year and, and into this new year was like, how much of these behaviors, this is something that, that clients ask us a lot of, how much of these behaviors and these changes, um, if, if this is the wildest disruption of consumer behavior and patterns and routines and habits, you know, how much of it will stick and how much of it is going to change into the future? Um, and, you know, a brand we get asked about a lot and I think um, has had a lot of attention lately has been Peloton. Um, we work with uh, a couple of partners, uh, Cardify, which is um, uh, a brand that essentially um, is in the card linking space. And so they are uh, privy to uh, the permissioned data of a lot of uh, consumers who are sharing with them, uh, you know, all the purchase data that they make on their credit cards and debit cards and things like that. And um, as some of that work, you know, we're able to go to that group and ask them how they feel about some of these purchases, you know, get, get some qualitative behind the, the quantitative behavioral data. And so when asked about sort of like Peloton, you know, we all make New Year's resolutions. Um, when asked if like, how, how much of that is gonna stick for you? Are you gonna keep riding this thing when you're allowed to go back to the gym or, or not? You know, like I, I, I look at that tiny sliver of 3% and I feel like, I don't know about you, but I will do just about anything with just about anybody the minute I'm allowed to again. So even if it was going to the gym, which was not a personal favorite of mine, um, I'm not sure that 3% is totally real, but it tells you where people's heads are at, right? We're still, we're committed to the things that we, we maybe bought during this, this period. We're committed to the new habits or rituals, or at least we believe we are now. 
Um, and so I, I thought that's sort of interesting to think about, you know, what, what yeah. that future might look like. Yeah, this one's a particularly interesting with a, such a um, immersive connected product that can really, you know, the experience is so good. It may actually have staying power um, and clearly their sales and profits and um, growth is off the charts. And, and, and I think it's the demonstration that like, even though you're disconnected physically, it really gives a, an experience unlike any other um, yeah. to bring customers almost together virtually. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, oftentimes I'm trying to figure out what's, what's hype and, and what's really helpful and demonstrative to, uh, to what other brands can be doing. I mean, Peloton changed a lot of things. It changed the way that people even pay for large ticket items. You know, they, they were one of the first big brands to adopt one of those new, you know, affirm, pay bright, like methods of payment. Um, and so I think, you know, this is one of those reinventions of the way right. we think about these purchases, even independent of, of riding the bike and being part of that community. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things, um, you know, you and I have joked a little bit about is just like, uh, I, I feel like the, tac the tactile nature of a lot of these activities is something like in this mediated, you know, version of the world, you know, we went to baking and we went to fixing things and we went to digging in the garden and we were like starved as human beings for something that felt kind of right in front of us and, and material. Um, and I, I don't know about you, my sense was when we went into this, I was like, I'm going to have so much time. I mean, I'm going to be home all day. I'm not commuting to work. Uh, I'm not on planes twice a week, which was, which was maybe part of my norm. Um, what am I going to do with all that time? <laughs> now I look back at that thought and think, what am I talking about? I have no time. Like, I feel like I barely have time to go to the bathroom between meetings um, and, and other things, homeschooling and everything else that's sort of bombarded uh, us in the house. And I also think that that, that sharpened, the focus on time as being a really important new currency for how brands think about the way that they they serve customers. And we've heard a lot of uh, calls, you know, uh, for it being a time for change in a lot of different areas. Uh, and so this this notion of time really, to me, is, is what started popping out as uh, something that will chart the course for, for 2021. Yeah, no, I, I think that's spot on. Like, you would think in some instances um, time, because people should have more time, they, the, the value um, and experiences that that's less so, but I think it's, it's only more so how important time is You're to right. customers. And, you know, we were joking that I, I've tried, I've taken on baking. I tried to have a garden and I cleaned my basement three different times and I'm not particularly any good at any of the three of those this year. <laughs> and I'm busier at work, even though I don't have a commute. Um, and I think that's just something, you know, as, as leaders and on our team, we've been thinking a lot about just like the employee experience too, and how do we take care of our employees and keep them going so that they can come up with more innovative ideas and, and, you know, the, the world of work and work and home was blended before all this started. Now it's just completely mashed together and, and, and balancing our employees needs and, and their personal lives and everything we're trying to take on in the work world is, is a tricky balance and something that we're still finding our way through. It is. I mean, I think you guys, uh, I've heard in your language, you know, the emphasis on preparation, going, going fast and, and cutting out things that are not of value in time uh, for people to spend their time on things that customers don't want to spend their time on. You want to talk a little bit about that preparation? Yeah, you know, um, 2020 was a wild year for Ford um, and and frankly, all businesses. And we were able, I remember it like it was yesterday, Friday afternoon, three o'clock, um, I got called into Mark Lenave, the recent really retired vice president of marketing sales and services office. And he and I and Andrew Frick, the uh, new head of sales were like, we need to do something. Um, COVID was just about to hit. We were literally walking out the door for, um, for, for a long time. And we needed to start thinking about how to take care of our customers and, and remote 
um, experiences. And overnight, we were able to deliver new and unique experiences to our dealers and customers. And it's not because we were super smart in that moment. It's because we spent the last two years preparing for the moment. And Jim Hackett really, in his tenure, really drove human-centered design and iterative um, customer experience design and marketing into our processes. And we'd, been, we'd spent the last two years testing, prototyping, building and piloting all these ideas. And while we hadn't launched them at scale, we were able to walk out the door that, that Friday afternoon with the framework of a plan that could serve our customers and our dealers in an emergency and launch programs without dealer training, without money and do it rapidly because we had spent so much time in the ugly bits of our business and redesigning and, and using um, a really patient method to prepare ourselves to think about how we wanna change the customer experience in 2020. And then frankly, well into the future. And so it was a lot of hard work getting there, but I, uh, I'm excited about what we were able to accomplish last year and where we're headed next year. Yeah, I mean, I think your your focus on kind of the the, the main interface to your customers, which is which is through uh, those stores and and those dealers, um, you know, that recognizing that like that extension of the brand is a major interface. You know, that's something that I think um, you know the the transformative experiences that are bringing about kind of a new brand loyalty are starting to show up in a lot of different brands. Um, I packed a couple, a uh, few examples in here. Um, you know, Uber, uh, not too long ago, introduced a uh, driver side loyalty program. So there's lots of consumer loyalty programs out there. Uh, this one is in particular, uh, in order to do, you know, better by their drivers, give them you know, some advantage on and off the road, you know, doing functional things and emotional things for them. And I think, uh, you know, that's, that's in an effort. Uh, Uber, Uber's had a, a, a winding journey, I think, through uh, their relationship here. But this was them stepping forward, I think, and saying like, okay, we've got to do better for the main interface that our users, our customers have uh, with our brand. Yeah, I think this this interface of making your employees experience easier is, is something we've thought a lot about at Ford as well. And, and this example from Uber Pro is like, what, what, are the, what are the use cases and experiences that your employees go through and how do you just make them serving your customers easier? And in, in the automotive world, it is super complicated when you think about 3,100 Ford dealers, 10,000 around the world, they each have 100 employees, they have different tech systems. And so we're taking a really macro view of how do we build those connected experiences and really empathetic experiences or empathetic experience design for like, yeah. how do we serve not just our customers, but how do we serve the people serving our customers? Yeah, that empathy. I mean, I was struck by this example uh, from Lime. Um, you know, that scooter business is a is a is a wild one, uh, and there is a there's a, a kind of channel that exists that's that's developed kind of symbiotically with these brands, which is uh, the group of people who go around and charge these scooters. But it was a you know at the beginning of this, it was a cutthroat uh, little world. And I think, you know, we saw a brand like Lime step forward and say like, we've got to do better than this. It can't be, you know, this this kind of like maniac orientation to run around town with a van and, and grab as many scooters as you can and, and whatnot. And so they, in, in fact, stepped forward and said, we've got to make this better for the whole industry. And I think that's the kind of leadership that, that consumers eventually come to know about and learn about and, and value in the end. Yeah, I think, sometimes the best ideas early have to evolve and you know it, it's just that it's that arc of learning and being able to evolve the experience and and how you go to market um that that frankly is hard in in the auto industry because it's you build it and and then you move on to the next one and and in the digital world teaches us to be iterative and and moving from 
online to offline in these experiences is tricky. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. This is real world stuff. It's not just a piece of software. It's a piece of software attached to a hard, you know, good out in the world that people depend on that has a whole ecosystem of people surrounding it. That is a, that is a very different proposition. You know, I was struck by even like a more, a more kind of localized version of this uh, empathy you know, at the beginning, if you put yourself back in that headspace at the beginning of this, uh, this crazy circumstance, you know, uh, little shops, uh, literally an ice cream shop and a taco shop, um, as just indicators of what I think happened all over the world, you know, they had customers um, who were of varying opinions about like, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. And here was these business owners, you know, who had employees that they were putting out there uh, you, you should read about uh, each of these two brands, but the story of, of them is, is the same either way. These employers, you know, had employees who were faced with this sort of tension that was happening and playing out in the world. And um, some of them, you know, it just was, it was too much for them. And here was these business owners starting a GoFundMe, not to say uh, because, you know, my bartenders or my, uh, my, my waiters, uh, you know, are not going to make their typical wage this year, but to say, actually, these people quit and this girl was going to go off uh, to college and, and she was depending on the money, but this was just too much. And so these business owners created GoFundMes to essentially still look after those frontline employees who were the ones kind of taking the brunt of this in the early days. And I just thought like, you know, understanding that we're all in this together, right, right down uh, the line of every single role, every single, uh, you know, person in that ecosystem. That's a, that's a big deal and a big shift and one that I hope we hold on to going forward. Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. I, um, you know, the role of retail employees in, 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 in 2020 and, and beyond is, is a tough one. And I think that dynamic of how do you take care of them so that they can serve your corporate goals, um, I think is something that at Ford we're really proud of. Um, we've delivered a, a, approaching 100 million masks um, around the world, um, built ventilators, but we really worked hard and in conjunction with our dealer body on making sure that they were equipped and prepared and had processes um, to, to deliver retail experiences in store and out of store. And we're gonna to touch on some of those out of store experiences in a second that yeah. we're working on. But, but the, the logistical effort it took to get us to this point um, was, was really hard. Um, I was joking with someone the other day though, that like, you know, Ford is not perfect at, at many things. Like we, we, we're a big company, but when it comes to like laying out a process and following a process, man, we're like really great. And, and, and following, taking the lead from innovation and design to manufacturing and then passing all that material yeah. um, logistically out to, you know, frankly, again, 10,000 dealers around the world and then having the analytics in place to, to enforce whether dealers were using it, were they using it appropriately, did customers feel safe, were customers happy with our preparedness, um, was, a lot, was a lot of work. But um, you know, ultimately we wanted to make sure that we were taking care of both our customers and our employees um, throughout the world. And, and of course that goes for our manufacturing employees as well. Yeah. And um, it, it's, it is, it is a phenomenal sort of um, effort that it took us to get here. Um, and, and frankly, when you think about how little production the big three lost last year, given everything that was going on and the ability to get the plants up, it, it was just a heroic effort to keep um, these teams moving forward. Yeah, I mean that humanity, uh, I think is is something to to continue to aspire to. I mean, living living those values right right at street level, I think is um, is is a feat for any large company. But it's but it's a it's an encouraging kind of rallying uh, for for purpose. And I know you and I have talked about the humanity 
in a lot of different customer experiences. Uh, this is a brand corner shop, which, um, you know, eventually has become part of part of the Uber family. Uber is, uh, you know, currently uh, gathering a lot of different assets uh, around the world. But these guys had a lot of traction in like Chile and Mexico, uh, and they, they started up in Canada. Um, I was struck, though, by this one differentiator, which was uh, the humanity of it, like the the moment where I get a phone call from, like we've all done some form of like click and collect groceries now over the course of the last number of months. Um, it's a highly digital thing. And you're, you're in there like purpose looking for the thing. There's no more, there's no more walking by something and being like, Oh, that looks interesting. And I'm kind of hungry. I'm going to, I'm going to grab that. And I got this phone call, which usually is a, you know, we're out of the thing that you clicked the button on last night. And instead, it was somebody saying like, hey, you know, I see you've got like, you, you've got, you got taco shells and you got this and you got some cilantro, but you, I, I didn't notice any lime. Like, you sure you don't need lime? And there, you know, as a customer, I was like, I do need lime. That's super helpful of you. Like, thank you. And then, you know, the, you know, the marketer in me and, and, and the business person in me is like, that was kind of a, that was kind of a cross sell, right? That was a bit of an upsell, but it didn't feel that way. And I just thought, win, 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 right? Like throw a little humanity into an otherwise totally virtual digital experience, I think is a, a really important thing for marketers to keep an eye on. Yeah, I, I, I love this example so much because this, that example, we talk all the time um, or we debate all the time the value of customer um, experience work and, you know, how do you monetize What's the return on investment on how people feel? And like, you can design digital journey maps till you're blue in the face, <laughs> but it's little things like that where you get to monetize a great experience, right? Like we always say the best experiences allow people to be more loyal and spend more money. And it's examples like these where you just make it a little easier or you add that dose of humanity that gives customers like that just opens their wallet just a little bit wider and is like, yeah, I do need that lime. Yeah. And, and you're going to remember that you're going to use corner shop just because you sold that line. So it builds, it builds value in customer centricity. And then like also like a much deeper loyalty. Yeah. It's not just for the sort of like warm and fuzzies of it. I literally added a couple of items over the course of that phone call to my bill which is good for the shopper who's getting a larger percentage of a larger bill, which is good for corner shop who, you know, orchestrated the whole thing in the first place. So that's, that's the one of the things that I love about it. I think, you know, one of the um, uh, other things just maybe as we, uh, as we go through the thinking on remote sales moments, remote service opportunities, et cetera, we see apparel brands uh, like this, you know, getting to a better state uh, of, of making it easier for shoppers. Uh, I don't know if you uh, had, had gathered any of what was going on with this, but Amazon is starting to like standardize the least standard thing on the planet, which is our bodies. Um, and I think like between their wearable about how much I'm working out or not working out, and then the fit of my, you know, t-shirt or, or pants. I mean, that's like, that's a crazy next level ecosystem, but closer to our category, I think, you know, all of that sort of on demand when I need it, when I want it, you know, has started showing up in a lot of different brands and a lot of different places. And I, I'd love, I, I imagine people would love to hear from you about some of the, the things that you guys have been uh, working on and piloting and thinking about. Yeah. I mean, I think this, the digitization and personalization is, is obviously a huge opportunity in the like people like me or people like you, data-driven experiences are a huge opportunity. You touched on, you showed the like fuel delivery and we've been, you know, this year, one of the big, big things that we had to really figure out is how to do, to do remote service. Um, service departments and dealers were shut down. Customers weren't comfortable to come in. Um, and again, we had spent a lot of time thinking about this because customers want ease and simplicity in their lives. And, you know, the service experience in the automotive industry is not, um, not easy or glamorous in any regards. 
there's there's no one that's doing an amazing um, job at customer experience on that front. And so we built um, the mobile service experience and and frankly launched it and, and are in the middle of scaling it um, throughout 2020. And it gave us a really fantastic tool for our dealers to go to customers, serve them um, at their home or place of work and really give them experiences that frankly, the auto industry hasn't quite figured out at scale. Um, I love this picture. Um, this is actually taking care of in like the height of um, coronavirus, one of the test labs in Oklahoma City used our mobile service to like, they were running um, COVID testing and having to deliver medical supplies and we were able to service them on the spot. Um, right. We also, you know, launched pickup and delivery and around the world um, served over a hundred thousand customers with the ability to have a driver come pick up their vehicle, bring it back to service, let them keep doing whatever it is they needed to do. We had a great focus group this year where um, a nurse was telling us about how she couldn't leave her shift, but just, you know, needed day-to-day -day things like an oil change. And we were able to like give her a new and unique service that um, frankly, our customers love. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, you know, from a global customer experience perspective, we really think a lot, we've thought a lot about transparency and trust in this world is not easy to come by. And, and, you know, our dealers in China are really thinking about how do we, how do we share what's happening in the service experience? It, it's really been a historically an opaque process and, and customers don't love that. And they sharing more information on time, um, what's happening with their vehicle, how much yeah. it's going to cost and, and, and a real just trust in, and the ability to actually build cameras in the bays and show customers what's going on with their vehicle has been a really positive step forward for us. Um, we're not quite at scale yet, but we're learning a ton from our Chinese colleagues on, on how to do this really well. And, you know, in the Chinese market, like technology comes together so fast yeah. um, that um, it's really showing us some cool ideas. I think that, I think that transparency and trust thing, I mean, as you like name these these components of of where you're focused, you know, those are the currencies that you know from our perspective with a lot of different brands that we work with, you know, those are the things that they are trying to almost like unitize and and be able to sort of push forward. So like the you know the transparency of like that video just popping up in the middle of like a chat I'm having with potentially a technician or whatever. Like I think that's the breaking of the sort of like pretend wall between the consumer and the brand that I think a lot of people are drawn to. And, and like you say, doing it between software and hardware and people and, and all the things that are in that ecosystem is not easy. Um, I pulled a, a handful of brands uh, that, you know, Apple doesn't need any more headlines, but I thought the watch in hey, particular. Sean, do, do we want to take our halftime question here? Uh, we yeah, got a we, couple uh, already in the Q&A. Totally. Um, I mean, the one of the ones that I see here uh, is about um, kind of the emerging skill set uh, and mindset that you guys are are centered around when you're thinking about bringing new people into the organization. What's what, what's on your mind about that? Oh man, what what a great question! I was just listening to um, if you haven't heard of CMO Moves podcast. Um, it's a great podcast. There was just a conversation about how do we build modern marketing talent? Um, and, and, and honestly, it's a lot of effort. Like it, it takes time. The, the design thinking frame set is something that we as a company, we've invested a lot of time and effort on training our customer or our employees. And, you know, it's funny. I'll, there are people that don't have that experience and background and there are people that do and the people that don't think of it's kind of like the dark arts they're not quite sure what human-centered design and design thinking really means and they're like well but, but I got an idea we can just run with it <laughs> and then the people that have been through the training and believe in the process are like 
no, no, no. You got to follow the process. And they love it. They're like these passionate um, evangelists you know, evangelists of this way of thinking and, and delivering um, innovation. And, and we're growing um, uh, we're growing that skill set in the company, but it's still it really takes time. And so, but it, it's also marrying that thinking to like really iterative development. Like, you know, automotive is classic for launch it and move on to the next thing. Yeah. And we want to launch small things, learn, get better, improve it and, and scale and improve over time rather than just like say, here's the thing. So yeah. um, that's, a, that's a great question, Wesley. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think, you know, that iterative nature you know, the, the, the conversation here about Apple, you know, those products change, right? Like I buy it and then it changes, it gets better presumably, or at least at the, at the very least it is changing and, and getting different on me. The, the, the financial services industry, I think has been, um, you know, also contending with, it's a complex product. How do we make it simpler? How do we refine it? How do we make that experience in your pocket just like that much more intuitive, easier to access, easier to understand and digest because, you know, we've only all got so much brain space. And so, like, I think, you know, the skill set that you're talking about there and bringing into the company, it's born of this sort of orientation, right? Being able to, like, work through the intricacies of uh, all of these components in a, in a fairly iterative manner. Yeah. Um, I think we've been thinking about this a lot and, you know, um, as a company, we recognize that the ownership experience is only going to get more complicated. Owning vehicles is, is complicated and confusing and there's more features and technologies than there's ever been before. But we're, we're, the industry is entering this new era where it'll both get simpler and more complicated all at the same time. Yeah. And the simplicity comes from the digitization and improved user experiences, but it will also bring about a real wave of potential confusion. We're always, we're constantly upgrading our overall experience, adding new features like mobile service or pickup and delivery. We're adding to the Ford Pass app, but we're about to start adding over the air updates. And so what historically was, I bought a car, I got trained on it and the car stayed the same for the life yeah. of your ownership. That whole model is changing. And so now we're like, almost like giving you over the air updates for the whole experience and they're constantly changing in the model of go back and learn from your sales consultant is like yeah. completely broken. Like that just, yeah. that just doesn't work. And so how we digitize and truly make an omni-channel customer learning perspective, because again, historically we train our retailers and they train our customers, but like we got to give an omni-channel dealer, web, app, in-car, in-person yeah. training experience that evolves and grows with our customer, their vehicle, and has to serve multiple generations of customers. Like historically, we've been like, well, we only serve the person that bought it, but like we got to now serve customers that are second owners and third owners and fourth owners yeah. of these vehicles. And, and that's a really exciting space, but frankly, kind of complicated and, and something we've been spending a lot of time thinking through. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, maybe to go loop back to some of the original examples we were talking about. I mean, you know, that, that Peloton bike changes over time. Apple telegraphs well in advance before, you know, iOS 12 drops, uh, you know. The yeah, but, the, but the, the, the difference is the Peloton bike, I mean, it, it, it does and it gets better, <laughs> yeah. but it doesn't do, auto we don't, you know, beam are down <laughs> aut autonomous lane changing overnight, right? Like the stakes are much higher and much yeah. more important for us to get right. I think that's um, totally fair. I think that's totally fair. It's I'm not gonna likely lane change improperly on my <laughs> no. peloton and end up yeah. in the wall. I think that's fair. Um, 
Listen, I mean, I think, you know, maybe, maybe as a last set of examples to, uh, to bring us home to the top of the hour here, um, loyalty is kind of, you know, what we've been talking about in its, in its grandest sense, you know, what is customer loyalty? A lot of brands have, have materialized that in, in kind of more formal ways, like a actual loyalty program, or, or in the case of uh, Sephora here, you know, uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, this was a, a weird year, and I think we saw a lot of programs do as they are doing here in this uh, in this Reddit thread. You know, they're extending the status you had with them. They're giving grace on things. They are, you know, it, you know, understanding the sort of humanity of the moment and not just carrying through with the mechanics of the way that the business used to operate. And I mean, um, you know, Debye and her team have been very clear about the sense of belonging they want in the core brand, right? They've got a program that materializes it and surfaces it. And I think that's true, but they've also got, you know, a community of people who are just enthusiasts in this case about beauty, you know, in your case about, you know, particular product badges and things like that. I think, you know, they've done a nice job of weaving together all of the components of what like feeling like a member of the brand might be in conjunction with some kind of formalized program. And I think they've been, they've been wearing their heart on their sleeve about what the brand is about and its purpose and things, but in a way that I think has been translated right down to the pocket and the tap of any member in the, in the formal program. So, you know, if you were uh, a beauty insider member, you would know that like, you can give to some of the causes that have been front and center in, uh, you know, popular culture and been uh, a kind of a key component of, you know, what Sephora is seeking to stand for in the world, but it's not just, you know, a check Sephora, the corporation writes to charity XYZ. It's actually down in the control of the, of the user and the individual customer. And I just thought, you know, that, that is an interesting example of this. Uh, I think Nike has taken some of the same kind of cues about the way that they think about their whole ecosystem as a form of membership, it began as Nike Plus. You know, now it's just kind of a Nike membership and I, I've got it for lots of different reasons. And I know that you guys have been going down some of those, uh, some of those same roads. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the things that I, I'm really excited about is Ford Pass Rewards as a foundation to our, our overall owner experience. And, and let's be honest, like, if anyone in the audience is rolling their eyes, like the world needs another loyalty program, like we need a hole in the head. I, I totally get that. But what, what Ford Pass Rewards allows us to do is really treat our customers in a way that we haven't done before. And one of the things that's cool about this program is it's the first automotive loyalty program that brings a bunch of different um, customer experience activities together everybody's had an app, everyone has a credit card, Every many people have complimentary maintenance. We brought all that under one program and one points ownership, service, sales, yeah. experience. And it's a platform that we think we can really grow on. We're really excited about our partnership with First National Bank of Omaha and, and and the ability to use a credit card to turn everyday spending into more purchasing power with us. But we also think about it in a whole multitude of ways. One, we think that there is a ton of untapped community potential in Bronco and Mustang, and frankly, people's passion around F-Series trucks and their commercial vehicles. And yeah. And there are clubs around the world that get together and talk about their Ford products. And we believe there's a bright future in how we interface with them. I mean, Andrew was talking to us at the beginning about how much he loves his Bronco. There are ways that we can bring him into the community and thank him for his, his passion for, for Bronco with things like Ford Pass Rewards. The other thing about the community that like, I, you know, again, this is a, a move fast opportunity that we threw together this summer was um, a thank you to frontline workers. And so 
any frontline workers, very broadly defined. Um, uh, this summer who are Ford Pass Rewards members, we gave them enough points for a free oil change. That was so popular, we gave away 750 million Ford Pass Rewards points to our members, just thanking them for you know showing up in tough times and, and doing what they do every day to serve their communities. And, and the, I think there's just so much more power to the things that we're doing and the places we can go with this platform. Yeah. And and while we're not quite to the level of Nike and Sephora and Delta yet, we've built the foundation of where we really think we can take this and, um, and we're excited about what we can do. Yeah, listen, I mean, I think, you know, as somebody who works uh, pretty, pretty deeply in that loyalty space, you know, a lot of those brands have been at that for 15 years. I would say, you know, your ability to, to move fast enough to bring together these kind of three components all into one harmonized proposition. And, and what I liked most, I think about your explanation there was just the, the sense of reciprocity. Like you did it, you know, here in this instance for, for frontline workers during the midst of a pandemic. Uh, I like the lean forward on, you know, for, for guys like Andrew with his 1971 Bronco, you know, the, the loyalty to brand has kind of been the orientation historically. And I think what I hear out of you and the sentiment that, that we would align with is recipro reciprocity from brand back, right? Yeah. And I think that this, if this is a platform for you guys to be able to, you know, let that blossom in a whole handful of ways, that's, uh, that's, o that's only good things as far as I can tell from the trajectory of the way the world is. Yeah. It's like, what can we give back to our customers? And, and, you know, it's a business, we want them to be loyal, but, um, there's a lot of money in the automotive ecosystem and, and we can do a better job of making our customers feel like we love them. Cause we do, you know, we find, we find unique ways to do that. And, and this platform um, gives us that opportunity. Yeah. I think that's great. I mean, that's uh, that's kind of what I had packed uh, for our discussion here. Um, Jason, I don't know if you've got any uh, other parting thoughts or, uh, or we wanted to, uh, to, uh, open it up to another question or something. What's, what, what's sort of the, the thing you're excited maybe most about, I have a hard time answering this about 21, cause it still kind of feels like 2020 to me, but what are you looking forward to most? Well, uh, as I said, we, well, first off, thank you for having us. It was really fun to come chat with the AdCraft group and, and share some of the things that we're working on. And um, Bond is a great partner in helping us with. Um, 2021 is, a, is all about acceleration. Jim Farley has a really clear plan for the company. Um, as I said, Jim Hackett prepared us. We're launching new products. We've got really exciting things coming, services, experiences. Um, the company in 2021 is really set to accelerate and we, you know, a lot of the things that we, like we tested in, in 19 and cobbled together to take care of our customers in 20 are really going to take flight in 21. And, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of exciting stuff uh, coming yeah. out the door this year. So that's great. I think, I think we got a bunch of questions starting to come in. Yeah. Loyalty is a long game. So I, uh, I appreciate the disciplined approach, I think, to, uh, to the way that you guys are moving. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have the questions up in front of me. Do you see? Yeah, I got one. Okay, so I'm not going to get out of here without answering the Google question. So Armin wants to know, um, any commentary opinion regarding the recent Google and Ford par partnership announced this week? And so one thing I would tell you is something that big um, and that important surprisingly was really, really tightly held at Ford. I knew something was coming, but I... I'm not a true expert on all the ins and outs, but what I can tell you is, is that you know, Jim Farley once said like, I, I thought EV was gonna be the revolution in auto, but it's really maybe the more exciting um, part of the future of automotive is the connected um, vehicle and, and the end-to-end -end digital experiences we can build and the way we can improve the vehicles and the just sheer volume of data that comes off of our vehicles. Yeah. And, and we, we've done well with that. Google, 
and their data processing and their cloud-based power and their digital strength I know can a thing just, too about it. <laughs> just really take us to the next level. And so I think it's an exciting partnership that really can deliver, frankly, for Ford Motor Company. I think we can be a power for Google. It can deliver for our customers and our dealers. So um, I, I think it's a really exciting opportunity. Yeah, it sounds exciting. And, uh, and I don't think you were going to get out of here with it, uh, with no. at least one of those questions. Um, <laughs> let's see. There was a question about um, Kay Clancy asks, how has Ford reallocated investment from traditional brand tactical ad buys to customer ex experience fo focused initiatives like Ford Pass? Um, I, I, I mean, I can't give you specifics, but like we have, like it is really about changing the dynamic of what we spend on the shopping and buying experience to taking care of our customers um, in the ownership experience. It, it is literally about less about selling the next vehicle, but taking care of them over their ownership cycle and delivering on loyalty and ensuring that they buy their next vehicle with us. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see, one more here. Okay. These are small. Uh, so Max asks, a, Max Poirier asks a question about how we're working with our dealers to continue training with evolving um, technologies, including electric and autonomous, um, and how do we keep the frontline staff um, to explain these and set their customers up for success. Well, that that is literally what we're talking about. Maybe not so much autonomous, but the complexity of our vehicles is high and growing. Um, and in some regards, what we want to do is digitize the experience because historically, the fulcrum of all learning had to happen in a 30-minute walk around when customers took delivery of their vehicle. Yeah. And it's, it's just too much pressure to put on our sales consultants to nail it. And they had to, they had to know everything about every series, yeah. about every vehicle in our showroom, and it's totally undoable. And so we want to narrow that focus. Here's the five things you got to tell every customer about activate their modem, tell them about Ford Pass rewards, set them up for their first service appointment and these three pieces of technology, and then we'll take care of the rest. And it's that digitization that's gonna allow us sort of evolve into the future. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the, the, the conjunction of sort of humanity and, and that digital platform underpinning, you know, working more collaboratively, I think is, is probably the right way to go loading it all into one direction or all into the other direction just feels like that's a, a bit of a fool's errand. So it, it makes a lot of sense from everything else that we see too. It's really good. Yeah, okay. I that's I, all we uh, had. Yeah, I think we're just about a time here. Um, and uh, Andrew, if you wanted to, uh, to pop back in, maybe thanks again from, from myself and, and from Jason for, uh, for giving us a couple of minutes to just share some perspective. And, and it's been great to see people share some back. Well, well, thank you guys. This what what an awesome hour. And a lot of times, you know, we find ourselves um, having media conversations or, or or creative conversations, and this kind of touched on everything. And it it really made me think of you know how how vast and, and you know other important avenues in the marketing and uh, in advertising landscape, and especially in this time when you know experience is everything. Um, this was just a a really powerful and entertaining uh, hour. So thank you for for spending it with us, and um, and 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 congratulations on all, on all the amazing work that you guys have uh, accomplished together. So um, with you. that, I, I wanted to thank everyone who, uh, who who tuned in for that hour. It was just a, a, a good way to break up the week. Um, thank you guys. If you're not members of AdCraft um, uh, yet out there, uh, go to AdCraft.org sign up. Uh, we would love to have you. And one parting shot, guys, if you can see, that's, that's the, that's the 71 Bronco right there, baby. So, uh, that thing's awesome. Yeah. Look man. at that pride. Look at that pride. <laughs> so thank you guys for everything that you do. And um, we, we hope to see you in person at a, at a future AdCraft event. We should be so lucky. Take care guys. Thanks, have a great Andrew. Day. Take care. Cheers.